Hello, Sick Career audience. On today's podcast, I have a new friend that I met on LinkedIn, like I meet pretty much everybody nowadays, Jean Kang. Jean is a program manager who's worked at some amazing companies. We'll dig into that here. Not only is she a program manager by the day at Figma, but she also has a side hustle kind of how I started Kadima. I started it as a side hustle while I was at Salesforce until I took off and went all in on Kadima. Anyway, we dig into lots of things in this episode about her career path, some of the decisions she made, some of the different companies that she worked at, including Facebook and Intuit and Figma and Pinterest and companies like that. And we talk about program management and do you actually need a PMP to be a program manager? So you'll hear that and more in the episode. As a reminder, if you're ever looking for some help in accelerating your career, I offer one-on-one coaching services. You do need to apply for that. I take a very limited number of people into that. And we also have a digital course, which is a lot more affordable and gives you the framework to establish your goals, leverage your strength, build your network, understand how the interview process works, nail the interview, and most importantly, negotiate for what you're worth. So if you like this episode, please follow it, please rate it, and enjoy this upcoming episode with Gene Kang from Figma. I am very excited today to have on this Sick Career podcast, Gene Kang. I met Gene like I meet pretty much everybody nowadays on LinkedIn. I saw some of her posts. I saw what she was contributing to the LinkedIn community and especially her conversation and her insights about program management. And program management is something that I'm personally very passionate about. I've managed lots of program managers. I've been a program manager myself and I just love the focus that Gene has. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Gene. And Gene, if you can just share a little bit about yourself to the Sick yeah. Career podcast audience. I'm so honored to be on your podcast. I've also been following you and admiring you from afar. So being on this is a dream come true. Thank you for having me. So a little bit about me. I broke into tech about a decade ago. I started my very first job out of school as an inside sales rep, aka one of the hardest grinds of my life. And since then, since I recognize that I hated cold calling and prospecting, I've changed careers a lot of different times, I think seven plus to be exact. Hmm. And since then, I kind of found myself plopped into a program manager role. So I like to call myself an accidental program manager. I really fell into it and realized like, wow, if there's something that I can make money doing as a full-time job, this is it. Um, So I ended up um, applying cold for a full-time program manager role. It happened to be one of my um, dream companies, aka LinkedIn, where we met. And then since then, I just haven't looked back. I found myself just climbing up the ranks, being even more tenured in my craft, being more confident. And then today that has kind of catapulted me to launch Path to PM. That's my coaching business. But through that, um, my main thing is being able to just educate, inspire, and empower folks to consider program management as a lucrative career path. Nice. And on the program management front, I love your tagline on LinkedIn. And it says, I empower people to land and thrive in program management jobs without a PMP. Mm -hmm. So talk about what a PMP is Mm -hmm. and how and why you think it's not necessary. Yeah. So if you're looking for like all the ins and outs of a PMP, what it is, I'm not your gal. What I do know about PMP is it is a, it's a reputable certification that a lot of project and program managers get. You see it a lot in job descriptions and required um, sometimes skills. Um, The reason why I say that I'm not your gal in terms of the ins and outs of the PMP is because when I applied to jobs, I saw that, recognized it, but I myself was never certified in the PMP or anything else for the matter. There's, you know, the Cap M, Scrum Master, et cetera, and the PMP, but me doing program management for over five years, I found myself 
doing really well in my job and being told I'm doing well without having the, I would say, the the professional knowledge. So that's a little yeah. background. And you have been a PMP at some pretty illustrious organization. You've been a program manager at yeah. some pretty illustrious organization. And first off, for the listeners who do not know what a PMP is, it's pro- a program management professional. And I believe it's a certification that people get for certain skills as a program manager. I've been a program manager. I've managed lots of program managers myself. Mm-hmm. I have definitely not taken a PMP. I have not, I don't think I've hired people that have had PMPs or if they did, mm-hmm. I didn't even know that they did. So you were hired at LinkedIn as a program manager, Figma as a program manager. Were, were you anywhere else as a program manager? Because I know you moved from sales to program management. Before my full-time job at LinkedIn, I was at Pinterest, but my job at Pinterest was a client solutions manager, a CSM. Mm-hmm. And though I like, but that role, I did project program management work that gave me the kind of confidence and the examples to shine for when I did make that leap to a full-time program manager. So in short, I would say I was doing the job before I got the job. Right. So (laughs) describe to me what a program manager Mm -hmm. does and how you were Mm -hmm. able to pick that up, get hired at some great, Mm -hmm. great places. You're still like you're working at Figma now while you're mm-hmm. helping other people up level their program management skills. Describe mm-hmm. what a program manager does to our audience. Yeah, of course. So I'm a big fan of analogies. The way that I like to describe a program manager role is think of it as a, a conductor that's orchestrating all these different moving parts and pieces, bringing different teams together to accomplish a shared strategic goal. So for example, tactically, what that might look like in the day-to-day is orchestrating meetings with cross-functional teams, setting the agenda, holding teams accountable for their specific outputs like tasks and milestones. Are people doing what they need to be doing? And and if they have questions, how am I unblocking that for the different teams? Have you worked alongside other program managers on your team or in the organization that have had PMPs versus you who have not? And have you felt lacking in any way or have you felt that it's held back your career in any way? That's a really good question. And I have had colleagues that I worked with that did have the PMP. And then I think the biggest thing that I noticed there is just like, there are some jargon that I'm like, oh, I don't know. Someone said it's the, there's like OKRs, which I know because I've been in tech for a while and that's how we just measure performance. It's called, uh, which stands for objective and key results. But I heard there was a, a different term it starts with the B. Maybe MBOs, uh, management by remember. MBOs or I, I, I don't know, but there, there's different terms. Yeah, it's not MBO, but it started with a V, but um, I know that he was like, oh, V2, V2, V2 moms, maybe? V2 moms. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, we use that at Salesforce and V2 Moms stand for vision, uh-huh. values, methods, objectives, mm-hmm. and measures, I believe. Yeah. And I may be mixing up, maybe that wasn't even in the, the PMP. That's like a very Salesforce specific thing. But there are times when there are jargons that I don't pick up on as fast or know what they are or, or some frameworks. So yeah, it's, I'm like, oh, maybe do I need to be knowing that? There, there are some times I question. I was like, oh, if, should I have known that through studying more up on those PM methods? But at the end of the day, I stick to what I know and just being agile. Every company is different, right? So the way that LinkedIn operated isn't necessarily going to work for Figma. So I try to come to a company in my new role on a just a fresh sheet of paper and figure out what's going to be the best method for this company based on what I know. Yeah, it hasn't held me back, not knowing framework X versus framework C. Yep. So you empower people to land and thrive in program management jobs, not with PMPs, Mm -hmm. not not taking the PMP. How how do you help people thrive? What sort of skills, what sort of functional skills or or what's like, how do you help them thrive and grow in their careers? Mm -hmm. What, What are some of those key elements? I would say I... I index really hard on the soft skills, the soft skills 
even in my role, I feel like I have to consistently like up level myself. What are some ways that I can manage expectation with leaders and executives? How do I get buy-in for something? That is a bulk of my role, especially the more senior I become sitting in the room of leadership and how do I influence and weigh in, help leaders weigh in on those decisions. And for me helping folks become more confident in, in those things. So talking through it out live, like how do you read the room? These are things that seem easy or simple, but they're really not. That requires a lot of practice and art. Are there some tips that you give individuals to better read the room, to better develop the soft skills, to ensure that they, a lot of the role of a program manager is influencing without mm -hmm. authority. A lot of the companies call it, they kind yeah. of evaluate for that mm -hmm. on interviews. What, what are some tips and tricks and strategies? Cause I, yeah. I do know that you lead a course on program management. So mm -hmm. if, if you yep. don't, you don't need to spill your, your whole secret sauce. Here, no, no, no. What are some of those tips and tricks that you teach people? The tips and tricks that I share, I would say it's the places that I like to share content is on LinkedIn through my Maven um, live cohort. And then I have my weekly newsletter, but some of the things that I hit on, for example, this week is like, is emotional intelligence. How do you foster emotional intelligence? Really tactical thing is leading by example right? It's for people to feel like, oh, this person isn't just someone that's telling me what to do, but um, she's dealing with her own challenges and struggles. So for me, um, when I do mess up and I mess up still too, even as a senior strategic program manager, I mess up at times, but I, I am very frank and honest with my team. I will say, hey team, I dropped the ball on XYZ. This is what happened. I'm very transparent about the situation. This is kind of like my learning. This is what I'm doing. And this is my ask of you. Being transparent about what's going on, owning up to it, being vulnerable, and then making my ask very crystal clear for the team. That's, that's just one thing is EQ and, and communication. I think that goes hand in hand with driving influence and authority. So I am a big believer of EQ. And Great. And your career has evolved from sales to program management, and you've spanned some amazing companies. And I'm just looking through your LinkedIn profile now. You're currently at Figma. Before that, you yeah. were at LinkedIn. You were also mm -hmm. at Pinterest. You were also at Facebook. Yeah. You were also at Intuit. Yeah. You also had an internship at Morgan Stanley. Talk about some of the different cultures of those organizations. What drew you to some of those companies? What led you mm -hmm. to be drawn away? from some of those companies as well. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you've had a very impressive mm -hmm. career at some of the best logos in the world. So I just love your perspective on how it was there, what drew you there and what drew you away from mm -hmm. there. I'll take a trip down memory lane. So my first gig out of school when I was an SDR, um, a sales development representative, it was at Intuit. I'm fortunate that that was my first job for me. It was just important that I got into tech somehow. I didn't care what, what company, what I did, but I was very fortunate enough to work at Intel, which is a very big known tech company. I would say they're more older school, but it's, it's predominantly known. For me, when I was there, I realized like tech culture is it's really fun. Even though sales suck because of the, just the high pressure transactional nature of it, the culture was very open. It was inclusive. You got a lot of fun perks and that kind of solidified, like, I want to stay here, but I want to explore the waters. So as my next play after, let's say into it, I'm like, okay, I've already done big company, know what it's like. What is it like if I treachered waters in like the startup world. So I like in between the big companies, I worked at a startup, a German based SF startup called Remerge, um, also tech based. And there I would say I, it was so, I think that that was one of the most I think, career defining moments for me, even though I didn't have the, the, the dream company title because I did so much of wearing different hats. I felt like even though my role is an account manager, I did like project management work, client solutions work. I did analysis work. So the, the connection point for me working at this startup was startup gives you more room to grow and fail forward. 
on top of the the fun, sexy perks. The trend that you're gonna notice with each of my next plays, each of my pivots, is I'm like a stacking on another layer on top of what I already know, right? And from this startup, I'm like, okay, let's try another similar-ish startup. So that's when I found myself at Pinterest. People knew what Pinterest was, but it was pre-IPO. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'd love to work at uh, another company, especially this one's like a unicorn company. How can I have that under my belt? So loved it, really scrappy to be able to witness a company from being scrappy to kind of like entering into this scale mode was really, really exciting for me. And then in the moment, I think I really liked the mid stage startup, but I had this great opportunity to be a full time program manager at a LinkedIn, which also happened to be my dream company. So I ended up taking that being at LinkedIn for almost two years. It was great, but LinkedIn is much more, I would say it can be hierarchical, right? There's a lot more red tape that I have to navigate that I haven't had to deal with before. So it made me realize like, okay, I've had all this experience. I've worked at big companies. I've worked at mid-stage companies. I've worked at the smaller startups um, that was like sub 20 people. And my heart goes to the companies where it isn't as big, right? Where I can wear those multiple hats, where it's not as siloed. So that helped me make the decision to take the offer at Figma because Figma for me was kind of that company that was like a Pinterest or a pre Pinterest. So I thought that would have been just the right size for me to grow in my role and wear those different hats that I enjoy. Talk about um, how you got into some of these companies. Like, was it cold application? Did they recruit you? Did you get referred mm -hmm. in? Because these are amazing companies. Yeah. And I would imagine as you have more experience under your belt and more logos and more credibility, it becomes easier, although it's never easy to get a mm -hmm. job. But how do you get into any of the, like some of the companies you've worked at probably like eight companies, in addition to the ones I said, some of the startups, how do you get jobs? And you've had some great yeah. jobs. Oh, thank you. You flatter me. Let's see. So the first, I would say half of them being liberal here was cold, just like straight up cold apply. When I got my first job at Intuit, that one was me going to the career fair, chatting up with a recruiter, hitting it off, applying, getting the job. Um, and even the job at Remerge, the, the Berlin based tech startup that I was talking about, same thing, found it on Indeed, didn't have connections, just cold apply. But I think to your point earlier about having some logos on my resume, I'm sure that they, it did help. I'm not going to discount that at all. Uh, there was a, right after that job, one job that I didn't mention was my gig at Facebook at the time. So the Facebook gig is very interesting because a staffing firm reached out to me, found my resume floating in the abyss, probably like on an Indeed or somewhere mm -hmm. on the online. And they had reached out to me about this contract gig for Facebook. And I didn't even know much about like staffing firms and them having kind of big name clients like a Facebook, but that's when I was like, okay, another amazing kind of logo under my belt. Yes, it is a contract gig, but I'm early in my career. Why not? That, that was the mentality that I had. And then from there, I would say first and kind of the only referral that I got in my career was when, when I was at Facebook, my contract was expiring. And one of the employees that worked with me, she asked me if I was open to exploring other opportunities. She was helping me out and she's the one that uh, gave me a referral to her friend at Pinterest and said amazing things about that company. So that time specifically, I did get a referral and then got the job, but the jobs after that at LinkedIn and Figma are cold. Wow. That's impressive. And we're other roles of yours in your background contractor roles also because there's pros and cons of being a contractor versus a ft mm -hmm. like a full-time employee so was it just yeah. facebook mm -hmm. that was contractor or did you have some contract roles besides that facebook was the only one facebook was the only one it was like one and and done for me i think it gave me the footing 
and the experience and the referral for that experience. Mm -hmm. And I catapulted my career, like me owning my career as a finding that full-time job at Pinterest, finding that full-time job at LinkedIn, and then just stacking on on top of that. That's a very common theme that I talk about on this podcast is owning your career and being proactive Mm -hmm. and intentional about your career choices. So as you think about, not to say that you're ever going to leave Figma, but I'm assuming you're not going to retire there. The odds are you're not going to retire there. I'm guessing you're a few years away from retirement. As you think about your career, how how do you think about what's next for you? You had an impressive career. You're you're doing this side gig. You work, you're a course instructor with Maven, and we'll talk about that in a, a, a little bit. But how do you think about your future career and building on what you have now versus what you want experience experientially or opportun- opportunistically going forward? So this is something that I think about not as much now. I guess it's because I, I have a full time and then that headspace is spent on like content creation and helping my clients and whatnot. But that being said, my immediate goal is continuing to grow within my craft at Figma. We're working on a lot of really exciting projects. The company is scaling. So I I feel like I have still a lot under, a lot to use the tools that I have in my toolbox. So I'm still very much excited to, to continue seeing what else I can do in my current role, in my current capacity. but thinking, you know, future gene, maybe that's five plus 10 years down the line. I don't know, maybe I'll be, I would love to consider being my own boss one day mm-hmm. and exploring how I can help more people tap into program management at scale. That is very enticing for me. And, you know, I'm just going to take it day by day, week by week, month by month for, for now. But I am very, that, that dream is very enticing to me. Awesome. And I would argue that you always have a boss, even now, even though I work like I'm the CEO of Kadima Careers, I always feel like I'm working Uh for my clients. They're my boss. They're paying my salary. So (laughs) it might be tens, hundreds of them, but I I look at them as the people that I serve, the people that I report to. So you started, you're a expert on program management and you're like, Hey, I want to give Mm -hmm. back. I want to teach people this. And you created Mm -hmm. this side hustle. I don't know if you call it a side Mm -hmm. hustle or a gig or Mm -hmm. part-time business or something like that. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you envision that, how you, how you balance that with your full-time job at Figma and how you, Mm -hmm. did you need to get approval from Figma and how Mm -hmm. did, how did you go about getting that? Yeah. Like just talk about how it is to juggle two different, I wouldn't call them two careers because they're overlap, but just talk about how you manage working full-time for Figma and also Mm -hmm. doing your course and up-leveling people in program Mm -hmm. management. So truth be told, it's not easy. I'll be very perfectly (laughs) clear is uh, it's, it is a lot of work, Um, but it has forced me to ruthlessly prioritize. For example, uh, when I'm working, you know, eight to five or eight to six or whatever, um, I am heads down dedicated to, to working. Um, and I put time for my quote unquote side hustle, like consulting calls and working on like strategizing for my business, the type of content that I want to publish on LinkedIn every day, all of that stuff happens either before I start work or after I start work and a lot of my weekend time. And a step back you asked about like but what about figma and all of that um do they know and of course like linkedin is a very public platform yeah. right all of my colleagues are are on there my boss is on there my peers are on there the ceo is on there so it was important for me to get figma's blessing to make sure that everything that i'm doing is kosher and um setting expectations up front another like project program management skill right how do you set expectations so people aren't having lingering thoughts or assumptions about what you're doing so these are conversations that i've had with you know hr and my boss to make sure that we are like aligned to a t um and a lot of the posts that i do right now 
uh, it looks like I'm on LinkedIn a lot, but I am pre-scheduling all of that going out at the exact same time. And I batch all of my things like seven to 10 days in advance. So I have a system down for how I do that, what I do, and I think I'm just getting better and better at it. So you've gotten into a lot of these companies, a lot of them through cold application, it seems like. The interview mm-hmm. process, how, do, how can people best prepare for interviews for program manager roles? So program manager roles are grueling to get. Uh, and I learned that firsthand. So oftentimes, just in terms of what to expect, there are case studies to prepare. I, I have never been in like a consulting interview before, but I would imagine it would be very similar in the sense that they give you kind of a business case or a prompt and expect you to deliver some kind of a presentation or a plan. And for me, I would say a couple of interviews I come, I like completely bombed because I didn't know how this looked like and like what good even meant, but I gained those skills through doing that in my current role, even before the title of a program manager. So I just used what I know. And that was like hours of putting together a plan, like an executive deck, making it very clean. And what are the core problems that I'm solving? What are the things that I, the assumptions that I'm making and the questions that I don't have answers to kind of like whiteboarding all of that out and being prepared to have a relevant three to five stories for the key competencies that the role is looking at always in my back pocket. I am a like a very diligent interview prepper, meaning I have docs on docs and I script out everything. I like to use a framework that's called what's the problem? What was my action? What was the results? And then sometimes I add a learning in there or try to connect it back to the current job at hand. But I think that has given me the the discipline to put in all of my all in prepping so that when I am live, I know exactly what I've done and it, it comes off natural. I don't yeah. want to sound robotic, right? You've gotten to some great companies. Were there any companies mm-hmm. that were particularly harder or unusual with their interview process but between some of the big companies that you were mm-hmm. in or even Remerge? Like, is there anything totally unusual, either the companies that you're in or other interview experiences that you mm. can recollect? Or, or are they pretty I think... Are they pretty standard and pretty, I wouldn't call it cookie mm-hmm. cutter, but if you prepared mm-hmm. for one, you could kind of apply it to multiple different uh, organizations. I'm very fortunate in the sense that I didn't have any like big surprises in my interviews, except one, actually. There was one job, it was a startup. I don't even remember the name of the startup, but I remember being locked in this WeWork office in San Francisco for six, seven hour long wow. interview, just entire, yeah, that's just one day. And I did like all the screens before too. This is just the in-person onsite. So that, I don't remember what role that was specifically, but that was extremely grueling. And I think they, I don't know. I don't know what it was. It almost felt a little culty and I'm, I'm glad that I didn't take that that offer but the other ones i mean interviews take sometimes a few weeks or some follow-ups to get my job at linkedin it took me like maybe a month or a little bit longer to hear back from them so i would say caveating bigger companies can take longer to get back to you and just have to be a little bit patient and instead of throwing your you know throwing the towel in i had a, a very specific incident that happened was i was a very first applicant in the first interview e and they were still waiting for more applicants and interviewers interviewees to, to kind of weed through mm-hmm. so i was just kind of in a, a waiting waiting game for a few weeks until they had enough people to interview and then kind of bring me along the ride that was interesting as we wrap up i have three more (laughs) questions for you one question uh you piqued my interest on your linkedin profile so right now Mm -hmm. on your banner it says accelerate your career in just three minutes for zero dollars you have that on your banner can you share any Mm -hmm. of those secrets or do we need to click on your banner to learn some of these secrets to accelerate careers in three minutes 
So what that is, is it's a, a call to action to my weekly newsletter that I publish every Friday morning. Every week, I want to give a tactical advice that is specific to helping either aspiring program managers or current program managers that just want to be better in their job. Topics include you know, PMFIing your resume, and what bullets are impactful bullets to have. And I think today's issue was around how do you write very succinct updates that are impactful, that are measurable, and they are to the point. And that's so critical. But you have to subscribe to, to yes. actually. Yes, and, and, and we'll, we'll share people, yeah. we'll, we'll share <laughs> the links with people so that they can subscribe mm -hmm. and get all those answers. But communication, mm -hmm. we didn't dig into that so much here, but it's so critical for program managers to be able to communicate with multiple different stakeholders, multiple different levels within mm -hmm. the organization, be able to communicate written and verbally as well. Verbal so. and nonverbal cues too, If especially in the, I try to be very nonverbal in even situations like this, but imagine when you're back in the office that uh, it all matters. Totally. So now mm -hmm. we're down to the last two questions. You've given lots of great advice here along the way. If there's one last piece of sick career advice you have to leave my listeners with as, as they're looking to mm -hmm. accelerate their careers. What would it be? My favorite mantra for myself and how I navigate in my career and what I want to share with the folks is just aim to be 1% better every day, whether it is putting yourself out there, raising your hand to run something, run a meeting that you haven't done or taking on a new project. Those are opportunities for your growth to have in your belt. You don't need to seek another certification or another different job to get that experience. You can focus on the now. Awesome. I love the 1% better every day. I also like, like something that mm -hmm. I always advise people is there's no dream job. There's no perfect job, but there's always a better job. Yeah. So just, and I think you've done that mm -hmm. well in your career as you've moved on and moved up, just always getting better in those different yeah. opportunities. 1000%. And the last question I have for you, Jean, is you shared lots of wisdom here. If people want to find out more, if people want to follow you, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way that they can contact you mm -hmm. and follow you? Best way is going to be on my LinkedIn. Uh, just find me, Jean Kang. My first headline is what you said earlier, empowering people to land and thrive in program management jobs without the PMP. From there, you'll have access to my newsletter, my LinkedIn post, and more. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing all this sick advice with me and the sick career audience. And I learned a lot here. I always like being in the midst and the company of other program managers. And thanks for all you do in up-leveling people's careers. Likewise. Thanks, Alan, for having me. Sure. Yeah.